today is a true pioneer in the future of mobility. Back in 2013 already, he was the team captain of a team of 20 with a self-defined goal. Getting solar cars to the next level. Let me tell you, they succeeded. For with Stella, their car, they went on to win the World Solar Challenge of that year. Almost 10 years later, he's pushing boundaries on electric mobility more than ever before. Please welcome the CEO of Lightyear, Lex Hoopsloops. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. And I'm, I must say, I've had worse introductions than this one. So, um, thanks a lot. Uh, so I'll dive right in. And uh, I think it's always important to start with the why. The why of why we do things, why we're on Earth, why we're doing a certain job, why we're spending our days in the way we do. And um, the same goes for the company Lightyear. Everybody has their personal why. Uh, the personal why of why they they worked on at Lightyear. And um, so for me personally, it goes back to the, the summers I spent in the Alps, um, where I uh, went hiking as well with my parents, when I realized that all the glaciers you see there of nature uh, is actually disappearing. Uh, while it's so vast and so big, how, in, how on earth can that be disappearing? Uh, because of us humans driving cars, right? The, the little tiny boxes that bring us to work every day. So, um, and the very thing that brought me to the Alps was actually the thing that was making the glaciers go away, right? So it felt that um, there was so much more that we can do. If we can go to the moon, if we can build a smartphones, computers, then why can't we fix climate change, right? How hard can it be? So then we realized what the actual challenge is, and the, the challenge is huge. So it's good that everybody wakes up. <laughs> Uh, so it's about 1.1 billion cars in 2015 is going all the way up to 2 billion cars in uh, 2040. And of course, we all realize that all of these cars need to be electric um, in 2040, because if, if they're not, then we're going to be too late, right? But it's a huge challenge when you consider that about 7 million cars today are actually electric. Uh, so there's a huge gap between the 7 million and the 2 billion that we need to get to. And then also, we have to realize that the second half of this is in places where there's very little infrastructure. So it's India, Africa, all kinds of places in the world where also they need to be driving electric cars. Um, and if you then think about, so making your house sustainable is easy, kind of. It's putting solar panels on the roof and you're uh, quite far ahead already. But if you do want to do that for cars, it's not just taking a petrol car and then putting solar panels on top, right? It doesn't work. Uh, so it needs replacing the whole car. And then from that, um, you have an electric car, but you don't have the charging points yet. So you need all the charging points, about 2 billion charging points. And then you need to clean the electricity that goes into these cars. Um, and you need to upgrade the grid to make sure that all the energy gets into these cars. So when I started thinking about this, I realized that it was so much bigger of a problem um, than, uh, than we might actually think it is for uh, sustainability. So, we made these very ugly cars, uh, which were very efficient back in the day. And so we started in 2012 building, as students, solo cars for the w uh, World Solar Challenge. So it's a big competition in Australia. You might have known the, the Belgian team as well in Leuven. Uh, they're doing very well. I think they won actually the last edition of the World Solar Challenge. Um, and you built these cars as, as a team of students. And this has been my biggest learning school and my biggest um, uh, lesson in my life of how to build a team because these are you're in a team that doesn't get paid even one euro to do this so it's all just intrinsic motivation and trying to get a team of 20 people 
uh, to build that car, which is quite impossible because none of the people in the team had ever built a car before. Uh, and at the same time, we were going to build a car uh, that had never existed before. Um, so we were building the first four-seater solo car. And that journey has been one of big ups, big downs, uh, late nights. Um, but it taught me a lot about teamwork. In the end, what we realized as a team is that what really works for us is if we're critical to each other, we can ask all the questions you want to ask because, well, the people that are designing the suspension of the car uh, hadn't been designing suspensions any time in their life. Uh, so you need to be able to ask them the questions. Uh, do you have your shit together, right? Um, but at the same time, uh, people need to appreciate that, that they receive critical questions and they need to be vulnerable as well and open about where they actually are, what they're going to do, etc. And when you keep doing that as a team, you're critical to, to each other, but also, of course, supportive to each other, then you start to gain trust. Um, and in the, the first couple of months, we started to gain more and more trust up until the point that we were in Australia um, during the World Solar Challenge, where we knew each other very, very well. We knew we, all of us, had grown a lot in one year. We, we taught a lot learned a lot about how you build solar cars. And that made us a very good team when we were there. And so the person on the left, Marald, was in the car. He needed to trust Yelmer, which was not in the car. He was in the strategy cars, was behind the solar car. And during the competition, six days in Australia from Darwin to Adelaide, Yelmer had to pick one speed that we were going to drive. Exactly 70, 71 kilometers an hour. And um, that needs to be calculated exactly depending on the amount of sun we're going to get during that week, but also the amount of hills we're going to get, the energy consumption of the car. Because if we would drive too fast, if we would drive 72 kilometers an hour, then you would end up with an empty battery just before the finish line and you're done. If you drive 69 kilometers an hour, then it's too slow. You could have driven faster. You could have won your, from your competitors. So you need to be right on the edge. And Yelmer's telling what speed Morald should drive, and he should trust that that is the right speed and just keep going. Um, and that has been uh, a way of really naturally working together as a team of 20 people without any hierarchy, uh, but with one goal, right? A goal of winning the World Solar Challenge in Australia. Uh, and with this team, we managed to win the first time we could participate in the World Solar Challenge. And that taught us a lot about what you can actually accomplish in one year, right? We went from not having a team, not having any sponsors, to having about a million in sponsoring, uh, a team that worked, a, a car that has never been uh, on the planet before, um, and then driving the World Solar Challenge in Australia. So that can happen in a year. If, if that can happen in one year, then what else can you do on this planet, right? Uh, get the, the possibilities are endless. Um, and that also gave us the confidence to go to the next step and say, hey, there's a real opportunity here to solve a big problem. The problem I just talked about, about how are we going to get those 2 billion people to drive an electric, electric car? They need a car that's independent. And if there's one car that's independent from the grid, then it's this one. It's, it's basically, I'm not sure who of you have been in the outback in Australia, but in the outback, there's literally nothing, really. Well, there's one village called Alice Springs with 15,000 people, and that's about it. Um, so no charging infrastructure there. So if these cars can work there, they can work anywhere. That was the idea. And that's the, the, the start of the company, Lightyear itself. So we're now a combination of two things. One, people that came from these challenges. We managed to win a couple more times after that first race we did in 2013. Uh, but we also added a lot of people that come from industry because building cars is hard. Um, and building cars requires not just people that innovate, but also people that bring in experience and knowledge of how to build a good quality car. Uh, and we were very pleased to have people from all of these brands, so people that came from Ferrari, from, from Mercedes, from Tesla, to, to collaborate on building those new types of vehicles called solar cars. And one big advantage we have is that we all realize as society that we need to move, right? We need to move to electric cars. Um, and I'm very happy that even the European Union is proposing to ban combustion cars um, and not allow them to be sold after 2035. But at the same time, who of you, perhaps, 
I should ask in this audience, who of you has an electric car? So that's just a couple of hands, right? Who has a combustion car here? That's a lot more hands. So there's still a lot of reasons, good reasons, why it's very hard today to, to drive an electric car. So electric cars are expensive. That's the first one. But secondly, there's two groups. The people that drive a lot, so the people that need a lot of range, um, they, they still have some issues with charging. And the next one is the people that cannot charge at home, that rely on public charging infrastructure, that they have to find a charger every time they want to, um, uh, they want to charge their car. And you see that in Germany, only 50% of people actually want an electric car as their next vehicle. And in the US, it's even worse, it's 5%. 5% of people actually want an electric car for their next vehicle. So there's a huge gap between what we want to be as society and what customers are actually uh, capable of buying because of the habits they have and the, and the money they can spend. So our mission really is how do we also get these difficult groups into an electric car first here in the West and then move to other, other places around the world. So this is our first vehicle. Uh, it looks quite a bit better than the, the cars we built. Well, my personal opinion, of course, everybody can have their own opinion. Um, better than the cars we had in the, in the World Solar Challenge. Uh, but the key thing they will enable uh, is more range. So about twice the range, you see it right there, and about five times less charging. And now I will go into how that actually works and how on earth can we, as a little company from the Netherlands, in a very small town called Helmond, how can we on, how on earth can we provide double the range and five times less charging? Uh, I'll go into the technology a bit, but before I do so, I'll spend a little bit. So we went from the small team of 20 people in university, started the company in 2016, uh, we grew a lot to a point where we're now about 400 people and 57 patents that we have patented. Um, and we're bringing the first car, so the lot you wanted to see here on the screen, to market this year. So basically there's going to be actual customers driving the cars that we dreamt of building at some point. Um, and you will also probably see them on the road here in Antwerp because this is close to the Netherlands and most of the cars has been sold in the Netherlands. So uh, the first time you see one, uh, please make a picture of that and, uh, and put it on Twitter or tell people about it. So, there's 160 reservations on the first car. We already have a second car that you can pre-order and that's a much more mass market car, so much more affordable, um, which has 5,000 reservations and is going to market in 2024. So it's three years from now. So this is just a quick, so you know what we're doing. We're not producing our own cars, so we are designing them. And then Valmet in Finland, they also build cars for Mercedes and a few other brands. They're going to build these actual vehicles. And uh, we also can build our own solar panels and then I will we'll bore you with that. So what about the technology? So what is the magic that actually makes this happen? How, how can, can we get to that double the range and five times less charging? Um, in the end, it's all about this. So here on the right side, you see how, many, how much energy a normal electric car needs from the grid. Um, and what we do is we reduce the energy consumption of the car through various factors. So we make it more aerodynamics, we reduce the weight of the car, we make the thermal system more efficient, and we reduce the energy the motor needs to actually drive the vehicle. And that gets us to, and this is the technical story, I will go through it quickly. This is about half the energy consumption as what that big bar is right there. So that means that on the, uh, on the same kilowatt hour, the same bit of energy, you can drive twice the distance. So that also means that on the same battery, you can drive twice the distance, and that's the key. So that's how you get to double the range um, with, uh, with the same battery, basically, and therefore at the same price level, because the mo by far the most expensive component in an electric car is the battery. Uh, it's, and it's getting more expensive as well with the resource shortages we have right now. But this is just half the story, because the other half is actually bringing in solar energy. Um, we do that by using different electronics and by really making the solar panel as large as possible. So it stretches out uh, on the entire vehicle, so the hood and the back and the roof of the car, uh, five square meters. Uh, you probably wouldn't think that you can actually fit five square meters on a vehicle, but that enables you to get to this point where this is the energy that the lighter one still needs from the grid. Uh, so 
That's about five times less as what a normal electric car needs. And that effectively translates into five times less charging. It translates into five times less cost for electricity. It translates into uh, five times less charging points we need as society. And what I am very excited about is that all of these technologies that you see right here are improving every year. So it's a matter of time until this little bar on the left is actually going to be negative. Um, for some places, for some drivers, not for everyone yet, but it means that um, if we can get that underneath zero, we have a car that produces more energy than it needs. Um, and how magical is that, right? That with today's technology, we can actually build cars that provide more energy than they actually need. Uh, and that's the point we can get to already for some markets. So for South of Europe, we can actually already get to that point. And efficiency is a very important metric as well, uh, in general, for how, uh, how far electric cars can drive on the same battery. So the whole industry is working on that, and that's where you want to lead. Um, and this was a very special moment for us. So the validation prototype, uh, it has a bit of a peculiar paint, but um, this has proven that it can drive the 700 kilometers, so the 440 miles, on a 45, uh, or sorry, on a 60 kilowatt hour battery. So that's a relatively small battery. And this might seem like, okay, these are numbers, it's cool, et cetera, but for us, it has been proving that the actual concept works and that it not just works for a solo car somewhere in Australia that's built by students and that can only sit for people in a very impractical way, but also an actual consumer car that can drive this many kilometers, so it's 45 kilometers on a quite a cloudy day. Um, this was proof for us because all of the technology that we developed, the motors, the solar panels, all the electronics, um, it all came together into this vehicle to actually prove on the test track that day that it could drive 700 kilometers uh, and also get uh, uh, 45 kilometers from the sun. So this was huge for us. And then the next steps really are to show what it's capable of doing in other places in the world. So we're bringing the car to Spain as well later this year. Um, in Spain, people drive about 29 kilometers a day. Um, if you look at, there's other competitors, by the way, which is great. All the cars, solar cars coming to market uh, because it's proof that it's not just one company, it's actually a trend. Um, and you see that larger uh, one can actually provide more energy on average on a day than what um, customers actually need in Spain. So it means that in Spain, the larger one that we're going to give to customers, actual people driving these, uh, is going to be energy positive, uh, generating more energy than it needs during the year. Uh, then for California, it looks good as well. And then even in Amsterdam, and please consider that Amsterdam is in the 1% cloudiest places on this planet. Uh, even in Amsterdam, it's more than half the energy consumption uh, can you get from the sun. Uh, so intuitively, that doesn't make sense, right? A cloudy country where it's still more than half the energy can come from the sun, but it's actually true. Um, although, of course, the nuance is that in winter, you get less than in the summer. Um, but all in all, you will get about 18 kilometers on average per day. Then, what is perhaps also, this last graph I'm going to bore you with. Um, so on the x-axis here, you see cost of electric cars. Uh, on the y-axis, you see range. So these are the two most, if you ask people on a random birthday party, what are you concerned about? Why don't you drive an electric car? Then most people will say, okay, they're either too expensive or they don't have enough range. Uh, so these are the two top concerns. And you see that all these cars, uh, they go to the right, they become more expensive when they add more range. And of course, this is due to the battery pack. You have to add more batteries to get more range. Um, but the magic, of course, in that, this is in that efficiency metric where you can actually provide twice the range on the same battery pack because you're more efficient. Uh, and if you can really radically focus on that one, it means that you can um, get to that place, and this is the tipping point, right? So if we can get to this, this bubble right here, he's, this is where most of the combustion cars are uh, that are being sold, the mass market. If we can get with our larger model, so the 30K, 35K, and 49K model into that bubble, that means that's the tipping point, right? It's the tipping point that a lot of people say, like, okay, uh, now it's the same as my combustion car, um, and uh, I'm willing to make the switch.
so that's the holy grail we're trying to get to as soon as possible. Uh, we're getting close, uh, but we hope we can get even closer, first for the West, but then, of course, there's so much more that still needs to be done. Um, so the first step is Europe, but I, I started talking about all those places where driving electric cars is even harder, like India and Africa, where this technology can bring electric cars down to a price point of 10K, perhaps even 5K, um, and therefore uh, open up electric cars for such a broad group of people. Uh, so our mission as a company is to provide one light year, and it's a measure of distance, one light year is 9.5 uh, trillion kilometers. Uh, drive that on the sun with all the cars on this planet, because all the cars on this planet today actually drive about one light year per year. Do that on the sun in 2035. Uh, that's a huge, um, huge goal that we don't even know how exactly we're going to achieve that and what kind of scale we would need. Um, but this is something important to work on. Even if the odds are against you, it's still important to, to push the limits of what is possible in terms of how big you can grow in a short amount of time. So I hope this was helpful for all of you and, and gave you a good impression of what we do. Thanks a lot. Hi, Legs, good evening. Thank you for your incredible keynote. I have a few questions for you, so maybe we should take a seat and uh, we can chat some more. Please. When we talk about scale-ups or startups, all, everybody always stresses that you need to be different, that you need to have a unique selling point. Um, so I'm curious, what is Lightyear's unique selling point? Um, so in the end, it's a bit strange where I just really believe you also always should start from, from a customer's point of view. So you should always strive to look for what is somebody's pain. Uh, so for instance, for electric cars, the pain is that people need more range or they need to charge somewhere and how to fix that. Um, but it was kind of for us more of an how do you say that, uh, accidental or a, um, something that, um, that came together very nicely because we worked a lot on efficiency, very efficient cars, so technology, that happened to be a great solution for a customer. Um, so I think a lot of times there's no kind of eureka moment, there's no um, uh, kind of master plan or, or, or a guide you can follow to, to come up with something that, that is worthwhile working on. It's always kind of coincidence, right? Where uh, there's the moving bits and pieces and at some point you go like, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> and I know it's hard to predict, but how do you think the market will evolve? For electric cars? Yeah. Yeah, so um, there's, there's a few really hard things that we all want to drive electric cars. Right? Nobody really, well, at some point, but um, uh, there's just a few very nasty, uh, how do I say that, <clears throat> humps in the road now with battery prices actually rising and the charging points need to be installed about 10 times faster than they're actually installed. So uh, the, the problem is the chicken and the egg, right? Where uh, you need the charging before people to buy electric cars and then, uh, and if you can circumvent that, that's a huge opportunity. Um, and I, if you look at how the big startups like Facebook, Google um, scaled, it was mostly because there was infrastructure called the internet that could uh, distribute the apps and the websites very quickly. If you can do the same thing with cars, where you can use existing infrastructure, just the sun and normal, normal outlets, then you can scale electric cars much quicker uh, and therefore remove a lot of the hurdles and remove a lot of the moving parts that you all need to actually make people drive electric cars. That's true, but two billion cars should be electric by 2040. How, uh, that's a huge number. How are you going to scale up that technology to make that possible? Um, yeah, and that's where uh, investment is really important. So you just simply need a lot of money to, to make it happen. Uh, so Tesla in his, in his early days raised about 20 billion euros. So I just to give it a bit of perspective. Um, but in the end, there's a lot of money that needs to find a, uh, a company as well, right? So there's, there's a lot of uh, capital for um, basically ESG projects, so uh, 
companies that do something worthwhile for this planet. Um, and being able to attract that is the most important thing. So basically what we need to do every day is think about, okay, what are the risks investors are looking at and reuse those because uh, we want to make investors comfortable that this is something that will for sure work out, right? There's, there's little risk um, and there's a lot of upside, of course, there's a lot of money they can earn by investing in lecture. So um, bringing the risk down is the most important thing we do every day and, uh, and that enables you to raise the 20 billion that Tesla also raised and therefore actually scale up, build factories, build motors, etc. And now a bit more about your personal mm. story because we have a long of, lot of young, ambitious people in the audience. Uh, failure is part of your story. I think they will be eager to hear about your wins and your failure. Um, how was your roller coaster as an entrepreneur? Um, I think the hardest moments have been the, the moments of commitment where uh, you actually are, so the, the first time that we, we put our website up where we said you can buy a car for 120,000 euros, that was in 2017, so we still haven't delivered a car to a customer, so it's five years. Um, and uh, then that's a bill, well if someone actually buys a car then shit, for a team of 10 people we need to build a car. <laughs> uh, and that moment of commitment. Uh, I think it's very important as well, because if you don't do that, then you'd get no nowhere. But it, it takes uh, that of the difficult moments, I think. And failure definitely is a part of that, because it could have just as well, uh, of course, we could have never uh, bought a car to a customer, and, and it still needs to happen, of course, half a year from now. But, yeah. And do you have any uh, final words of advice to uh, our students or our young entrepreneurs? I think it's important to not... Um, uh, so a company like Lightyear, you need hundreds of things, like hundreds of departments, an HR department, you need to find something. So you need a lot of things, but you cannot start with thinking about everything from the start, right? You just take the first thing, a business case or a, um, a customer you want to please and then build from there. Uh, I think it's sometimes you get paralyzed because there's so much you need to do, but it's just a take the first thing and start. Uh, and then the road will be very misty, so there's a lot of you don't know where you're going to end up. Uh, for us, it hasn't. And I, we still don't know, right, where we're going to be in two years. And uh, you have to be, kind of accept that. Uh, well, that, that, well I, I've learned to accept that. And that's been a tough process. Yeah. Vero said it already. Uh, human capital is really important for a scale-up. What kind of mindset are you looking for uh, in young entrepreneurs when you're interviewing them? Um, I think, uh, and it has been said earlier, this uh, so curiosity is very important, but also just trying. And it's, trying also, also just means being bold sometimes because uh, you need to try something which you don't know whether it's going to succeed. And, uh, and that's a difficult step for, for, uh, for, for a lot of people, including myself. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so that's... Uh, just trying things, right? Trying and be curiosity is very important. Okay. To round up, are there some questions from the audience for Lex? Oh yeah, many questions. <laughs> Can I have a bit of light, please? I see here in the front row and then on the third row. Um, hi, my name is Etienne. I know that currently your focus is on creating a car that can sustain itself in terms of Produce, needing a lot less electricity to run, but also harnessing some of the power from, well, the sun. Do you think ever in the far future or maybe in the future generations of your company, you would be interested in developing a car that instead of only, see, only focusing on solar power, you would also be able to harvest the, well, not really sunlight, but the light that comes from the moon for perhaps in Antar places like Antarctica where they don't have sun for several months? Yeah, so that's, that's a very hard one. So I think it's physically, it's, it's almost impossible to do that. So there will always be a, a hybrid of, uh, so basically 90% of the world has access to electricity. So even people in Africa have, have, have plugs they can use to, to, for all kinds of home appliances, right? So, uh, so what we say is if you can rely on just those plugs, the, those outlets, um, and, and the sun, then you have the two energy sources that you have anywhere on the, on the earth, and therefore you can enable 80%, 90% of people to drive electric cars. The remaining 10% is super hard. Um, and probably, so if, you're, if you don't have electricity in your home, then probably you also don't have the money to buy a car, so, um, but, but still, I hope that we can, um, 
even for those people, we can try to provide a solution where they can use their neighbors or their uh, something, some, something on the other side of the city, etc. So, but uh, using moonlight is going to be physically impossible. We but good question. Yeah. <laughs> we have time for uh, some more questions there on the third row. I see. Uh... Let's say hackers, Russian hackers, would hack the power system, and there would be a blackout. Could this amazing car with the solar panels be used as a kind of mobile power bank and charge all our, or, or a couple of, uh, is it self-powered? Can the solar panels charge the battery and be used as a kind of power bank for all kinds of electronic? That's, that's definitely an opportunity. We can do that. So. Um, Especially going further into the future when the car is going to have much more <coughs> uh, energy coming in because solar cells get more efficient every year, right? Um, that's where you want to start thinking about what to do with the energy that, that is left in the car, right? So you can charge it back to the grid. You can also use it to, to stabilize the grid. Um, but you could even, if there's some worthwhile, so you have computers in the car as well for autonomous driving, so why don't you use those to do something worthwhile, right? Um, perhaps run climate models or something and calculate something. So there's all kinds of things, it's a, but it's a luxury problem, right, so to have. All right, our time has run out. Lex, thank you so much for joining us here in Antwerp and inspiring the next generation of entrepreneurs. Please give them a warm applause.